This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Ancient biblical interpretation, by which I mean the way that the Bible used to be understood from late biblical times uh, through the Middle Ages and beyond, is everything that modern biblical scholarship has sought to correct. And the work of these uh, modern biblical scholars, such as the one who introduced me, um, has, um, has been uh, extraordinarily successful. Uh, thanks to modern historical methods, archaeology, comparative Semitics, and other new disciplines, we know an awful lot more about the Bible uh, than we did before. To begin with, we know a great deal about the individual books that make up the Bible, how they came into existence and when, and in some cases, why they were written. Archaeologists have uncovered the lost civilizations of ancient Israel's neighbors, as well as a good portion of ancient Israel itself. We now know a lot more about the political and social circumstances uh, in which different um, uh, biblical events arose. We know uh, previously unknown languages of the region, ancient Egyptian, Akkadian, Hittite, Ugaritic, and others. And these have helped us to understand biblical Hebrew far better than before. Of course, uh, studying uh, dead languages is, uh, is, is a difficult undertaking, but the wonderful thing about it is there's nobody around to correct your pronunciation. So, uh, anyway, these interpreters had a, different, uh, a, dif a definite program, um, a particular way of approaching the text. Um, the books that they were interpreting generally dealt with things that had happened long before their time the history of Israel's remotest ancestors, Abraham, Jacob, King David, and so forth, or the laws that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. But these interpreters were determined to make those ancient writings relevant to their own day. That was really their, you know, one of their main goals. They looked to the Bible for guidance in their own affairs, and you know, this probably sounds natural, but it's in part because of these interpreters that it does sound natural. These were books about the distant past, even in the days of these interpreters, but they wanted to read them as if um, they were giving us guidance uh, for today. And that meant putting a certain spin uh, on these books, uh, reading everything they could as if it were not just history, not just about the past. I, I think I can make this clear if I mention a, a specific example. And I, I suppose I, I like this one because almost everybody knows the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, the, the Hebrew Bible begins by relating uh, the story of Adam and Eve, the first human beings created by God. Everyone today knows that this story is basically about the fall of man. Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden to lead a sinless, immortal existence. But then the devil, in the form of a serpent, tempted Eve to eat the apple and the pear was kicked out of the garden forever. Ever since then, human beings have been sinful creatures punished with death. But actually, none of the things I just mentioned is in the Genesis story itself. It makes no mention of any fall of man, nor is life in the Garden of Eden ever described as a sinless existence. It never says that Adam and Eve were supposed to be immortal, there is no devil in the story, just a talking snake, and in fact, uh, no apple. Um, it's just called a fruit. Um, all of these elements were created by the ancient interpreters, and they have been superimposed on the words of the biblical story uh, ever since. The story itself is actually rather puzzling to modern scholars. Some have suggested that it's really about a significant moment that many societies experience, uh, the transition from being a hunter-gatherer 
civilization in which people survive by eating whatever they happen to find growing on trees or running around in the wild to living in settled agricultural communities. You know, agriculture is not a, a natural event. People have to discover uh, agriculture. And in some ways, it's kind of counterintuitive. You take a seed that otherwise you could eat and you uh, put it in the ground, uh, you know, and, and in place of that one seed, you get a whole stalk of wheat on which there are lots of seeds. And um, I guess that's how compound interest works. In any case, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was discovered. And, uh, uh, and that moment did happen in history at different points on the, on the globe. The ancient Near East was one of the first places in which it was practiced. In part, scholars say, um, some of you may know more about this than I do, but in part because, uh, uh, because um, chickpeas are native to the region. And it, you know, if you plant them, you can have hummus, and that and a little wheat will do you for centuries. So, uh, <laughs> so it did develop in the ancient Near East. Modern scholars don't think the biblical, and, and in other places, um, modern scholars don't think that the Bible actually preserves a historical uh, memory of this transition to agriculture. It happened long ago, long before our most ancient texts were written. Rather, the story in the Bible appears to be a kind of speculative recreation, perhaps based on, the, on reports of distant civilizations in which people had not yet made this transition, but survived by hunting and gathering and wandering around in a shocking state of undress. And, and so at first, Adam and Eve live in a marvelous garden where all their needs are supplied by picking fruit off the trees. But then they become wise by eating from the forbidden tree, and suddenly they know much more than before. Thereafter, Adam is punished in these terms. In toil you shall eat all the days of your life. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat your bread. In other words, Adam is condemned to become a farmer. That wasn't the only thing that happened after Adam and Eve ate from that tree. As a result, it says, their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. Humanity, at exactly the same period, now acquired more and more sophisticated clothing. So that looking back uh, from that standpoint, those earlier days in the marvelous garden seemed childlike and primitive. Anyway, that's basically how this text looks to at least some modern scholars. Uh, as for the snake in the story, he seems to be just a snake. Snakes were worshipped in the ancient Near East. Perhaps the oldest Semitic inscription ever deciphered seems to speak of a mother snake figure. And snakes were sometimes thought to be wise. In any case, the snake in the story is certainly not the devil. There was no devil in ancient Israel until much later, toward the end of the biblical period. So how did this story become the Adam and Eve story that we know? Uh, the first change I can't uh, document, it happened slowly, it was a change in assumptions about the Bible, maybe a willful change, at least to move forward dramatically by those interpreters that I mentioned. But it began earlier, perhaps around 500 or so before the Common Era. People came to assume certain things about the Bible uh, that the Bible itself didn't say. In fact, all of them contradict what we normally assume about a text. The first is that as they approached the text, they, they seem to have naturally assumed that although it says X, what it really means is Y. That, uh, you know, it's a fundamentally cryptic uh, document. Uh, that is this, uh, this first assumption. It's not to be taken literally. It says X, but what it really means is Y. The second assumption is that uh, these biblical texts uh, are essentially a book of lessons. It's not just history, not just about the past, but history with a purpose to tell us something to do or think today in that sense. Um, uh, these biblical texts are fundamentally relevant. Uh, that's the second assumption. The third is that um, although, and I, I suppose I should go back and stress that these are all kind of counterintuitive. When you read a text, any other text, if it says X, you assume it means X, not Y. And uh, if you're reading something about the past, 
uh, you wouldn't feel that it's necessarily telling you what to do. You can read Hammurabi's laws and say that's very interesting, uh, but uh, I don't think you would say, now well, let's go out and you know, kill our slave or whatever it says. Um, but that was uh, how people um, sought to read these texts. They're about the past, but they're telling us what to do. The third um, assumption is that Although these biblical texts clearly, and nobody denied this, came from different periods, were written down by different people, arose in different milieu within the biblical world, they were assumed to be perfectly consistent. That is, any particular work didn't contain contradictions within itself. Uh, uh, but further than that, even Isaiah, for example, the book of Isaiah agrees with the book of Deuteronomy or the book of Proverbs. Uh, sheds light on the book of Genesis. They're all assumed to be perfectly consistent. And the fourth assumption is that all these, um, all these books were somehow divinely given or divinely inspired or approved by God. Nobody ever doubted that about those verses that said, uh, and God spoke to Moses saying dot, dot, dot. The dot, dot, dot was certainly taken to be a divine speech, but at this point, Everything else also became divine speech, even those words, and the Lord spoke to Moses. Or to take the outstanding example, the book of Psalms, which is a, a collection of songs of praise or prayers to God, uh, but they came to be understood as uh, having been given by God. David divinely inspired, recited these words of prayer. Uh, well, those were the four basic assumptions that uh, were put forward uh, by these ancient interpreters. And in the case of the story of Adam and Eve, uh, they were crucial because, um, uh, especially the third, because on the face of it, this story has a few glaring contradictions. When God instructs Adam about what to do and not to do in the garden, he says as follows, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Well, the problem that bothered ancient interpreters was that phrase, on the day that you eat of it. Um, actually, Adam doesn't die. He gets kicked out of the garden, uh, but then he goes on to live to the age of 930. So why should the Bible say on the day? This wasn't a big problem, but still you can imagine that teachers would teach this text year after year, copyists would copy it. They must have wondered why did this story have God say on the day when that turned out not to be true. You might think that uh, God was the sort of divine parent of which uh, I am a human copy. You know, sometimes parents make uh, vain threats they really don't intend to carry out. Uh, but even if that were true, why would, you, why would you put it in the Bible? I mean, it's bad enough that it happened, but, you know. <laughs> so interpreters looked for other solutions, and one other solution was the idea that God's days are different from ours. After all, the Bible starts off by saying that the whole universe was created in six days. It must have seemed to ancient interpreters that that was a rather short time to have made, even for God, to have made so much stuff. Um, not just the earth with all its seas and rivers and mountains and deserts and forests, but also the sky and the stars and everything else. What's more, there was a verse in the Bible itself that suggested that time was different for God uh, and for mankind. Psalm 90 compares the fleeting human lifetime to God's eternity. It says, a thousand years in your, that is God's sight, are like yesterday. Well, if you take that seriously, perhaps what it meant was that there's an actual unit of time, a yesterday of God's, or indeed a day of God's, that lasts a thousand years. This idea is made explicit in a number of ancient Jewish and Christian texts. For example, the New Testament second letter of Peter observes at one point, uh, but do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Uh, similarly, uh, Genesis Rabbah, an early rabbinic text, says one day of God's is a thousand years long, as it says in the Psalms, a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday. <clears throat> 
So here was one possible solution. When God says to Adam, on the day that you eat of it, you will die, he was referring to one of God's days. And indeed, Adam lives to the age of 930, which means he must have died sometime in the late afternoon of one of God's days. <laughs> but uh, that still left unanswered the basic question, why delay the punishment so long? Justice delayed is justice denied, I think. Uh, um, uh, why didn't God kill Adam right away? There was another possible explanation. It understood you shall die not as you shall fall over dead, but you shall become a person who dies. You shall become mortal. This explanation assumes that God originally created Adam and Eve to be immortal. They would continue to live in the garden forever and ever so long as they obeyed the rules. I didn't mention this before, but certainly there was another tree mentioned in the story called the Tree of Life. Its function is not at all clear in the original story. It's only just mentioned. Uh, but for champions of this interpretation, it seemed to be in the garden to ensure Adam and Eve's immortality. Presumably, all they had to do was take a hit off that tree every century or so, and their continued existence was guaranteed. Um, so if on the day that you eat of it, you shall die, really meant you shall become mortal, then the sentence was indeed carried out. They turned into ordinary human beings, and after a full, rich life of 900 years or so, ceased to exist. This interpretation is also widely attested and early. Uh, ben Sira, who lived at the beginning of the second century before the Common Era, said, from a woman's, uh, woman was sin's beginning, and because of her, we all die. Uh, the women part, I'll maybe get back to in the questions. But uh, the important part here is that you know, that happened, and because of that, we all die. Similarly, the book of 4th Ezra, written in the first century before the, of the Common Era, says, you set one commandment on Adam, but he violated it. As a result, you established death for him and his descendants. But actually, the, this wording brings up a, uh, uh, another question, uh, and, and one that did bother ancient interpreters. It's fine for Adam and Eve to have been pu uh, punished with uh, mortality. They certainly deserved it. But why punish me? I didn't eat <laughs> from that fruit. Uh, well, one possible answer is that mortality is hereditary. Uh, <laughs> After all, uh, heredity is a powerful force in life. Uh, as they like to say at Harvard, if your parents didn't have any children, chances are you won't either, right? It's a heredity. Uh, so um, that might be what happened. Um, ancient uh, Adam and Eve became mortal, and this mortality was inherited by their descendants. But ancient interpreters came up with a better idea. It wasn't mortality per se that was hereditary but sinfulness. Adam and Eve had something in them that led them to disregard God's commandment. And ever afterwards, human beings have been disobeying and sinning and being punished in the same way. Or an alternate version of this theme is that once they were kicked out of the garden, Adam and Eve no longer had the possibility of living a sinless existence. So now they and their descendants were condemned to die forever and ever. For people familiar with the New Testament, this must sound familiar since the fall of man came to be a favorite uh, Christian theme, but it actually was a favorite Jewish theme in the first century of the Common Era. Here again is 4th Ezra. He says, for the first Adam burdened with an evil heart transgressed and was overcome. Thus the disease became permanent. O oh, Adam, what have you done? For though it was you who sinned, the fall was not yours alone, but ours also, who are your descendants. This might be the first use of the term, the fall of man. Anyway, uh, there's much more to say about this story, and maybe we can return to it later, but I hope I've given you an idea of how these interpreters uh, worked. They read the text very carefully with attention to each word, uh, but they also tried to transform it in the way that I've described. Suddenly, the story of Adam and Eve is no longer about the invention of agriculture or elaborate clothing, but instead it is all about morality and mortality, God's commandments and the disastrous effect of not obeying them. Quite consciously, at least, um, these interpreters 
um, set about reconfiguring as much as they could of, the, of these ancient texts to make them correspond to their own highly ideological, God-centered outlook. The stories of Genesis, all of them, were, as it were, written anew, not by changing any of the words, but by changing the basic assumptions with which those words were approached, as well as what those words were interpreted to mean. So now, with your permission, I'd like to look at a few more examples of ancient biblical interpretation. I wanted to start off with the story of Cain and Abel. Um, some of you know the basic story. Adam and Eve uh, had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And they decide at one point to bring the sacrifices to God. And God prefers Abel's for reasons unknown. And Cain is furious and his, in his rage, he kills Abel and God punishes him with exile. Well, that's the basic story. But the opening sentence of the story posed a problem for ancient interpreters. And I have to say, often, maybe 90% of the time, the starting point uh, of these ancient interpretations is something that's a little bit tricky, bothersome, not logical in uh, the biblical text, or just something people can't really understand. Um, so that opening sentence reads, now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have acquired a man with the help of the Lord. One of the things that's fun is to compare different uh, you know, translations. And I, I, you know, I usually end up translating things myself uh, as a result. But I remember uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, one, you know, people, this isn't the point of what I'm going to say, but uh, I have acquired uh, a man. Uh, that sometimes translated as I have created. I saw... Uh, a, a, a rather recent translation that says, I have produced, it sounded very kind of business-like, but uh, whatever, I, I have acquired a man with, and it says in most translations, the help of the Lord. Well, to begin with, it doesn't say the help of the Lord, it says I have acquired a man with the Lord. Um, so an ancient interpreters wonder why would a mother contemplating her newborn son say I have acquired or created or whatever, a man with the Lord. Uh, ancient Israelites didn't refer to babies as man-child or anything like that. The word man, in Hebrew it's ish, uh, means a fully grown man. In fact, sometimes it's an honorific title, a uh, kind of nobleman. Uh, also, interestingly, sometimes it's used to refer to angels. Uh, Jacob fights with a man all night, um, uh, and Daniel sees a man. Um, uh, so that was one question, why I have um, uh, acquired or whatever a man. The, the second was the, the rest of the phrase, uh, acquired a man with the Lord. Uh, these were the questions this opening sentence raised. And if you look at how they were translated in one of the ancient Aramaic targums, I should say a targum is it, just the, uh, a word for an Aramaic translation. Uh, but translation is not always appropriate. These, these translations were often rather discursive, as you'll see. So item number two on the uh, handout is a, uh, a quote from uh, one early Aramaic translation. Adam knew about, and this is allegedly a translation of those same verses, a verse that we read, and Adam knew about his wife Eve that she had conceived by Samael, the wicked angel of the Lord, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. He resembled the upper ones, that is, the angels, and not the lower ones, us humans. And she said, I have acquired a man, indeed, an angel of the Lord. Well, how has this interpreter changed the text, or how has he not changed the text? Everyone knows that the word no in the Bible sometimes refers to sexual relations, the biblical no. So in the biblical story, Adam knows his wife and she becomes pregnant. In this translation, Adam knows in our sense of no. He understands or finds out that his wife is pregnant from some other male, namely the wicked angel Samael. I did say that there was no devil yet in our sense at the time uh, of the uh, uh, original story, but by the time this Aramaic Targum came along, uh, the devil was well on his way. In some texts, uh, 
He is called Samael. He's an early devil-like uh, figure. So the scenario envisaged in this Targum is a bit like Rosemary's baby. I, you know, <laughs> I say this, and the students now look back at me and they say, what's that? <laughs> but uh, some of you may remember that movie. Eve sleeps with the devil or wicked angel and gives birth to an ish, an angelic creature. Uh, the phrase used in the, bi in the biblical verse, I've acquired a man or angel with the Lord, is thus being interpreted as with an angel of the Lord, namely the wicked angel Samael. So now it all makes sense, not just philological sense, but theological sense, as we'll see in a minute. But first, uh, I want to mention another question arising out of the continuation of the biblical story, and this is in passage 3, I assume. Uh, it says, next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground, a farmer. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought uh, um, of the firstlings of his uh, flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So here's the question. Why should Cain have been angry at Abel, uh, angry to the point of killing him? Shouldn't he have directed his anger at God? After all, God was the one who rejected his sacrifice. Um, so here is the Targum's answer. This is passage number four. After the incident of the sacrifices, Cain said to his brother Abel, Come, let us go out into the field. And it came to pass when the they two had gone into the field that Cain cried out to Abel, It is my view that the world was not created with divine love and is not arranged in keeping with people's good deeds. But justice is corrupted. For why else was your sacrifice accepted with favor and mine not? And then Abel said to Cain, no, my view is that the world was indeed created with divine love and is altogether arranged in keeping with people's good deeds. But it was because my deeds have been better than yours that my sacrifice was accepted with favor and your sacrifice was not. That might have been a truthful answer, but it was an unfortunate choice for Abel. <laughs> um, uh, they end up in a kind of theological argument. The wording is somewhat highfalutin uh, in Aramaic, but it boils down to Cain saying to Abel, you know, they, they've just offered these sacrifices. Cain gets rejected, and Cain walks out. And he says, you know, doesn't that just, that's just so typical. Uh, you know, what goes on in this world is completely unpredictable. It's random. God doesn't care. There's no justice. And Abel, unfortunately, has an answer to Cain's complaint. It's not random at all. I've had a history of good deeds. I'm basically a good guy. Uh, and you don't have any good deeds. Uh, uh, he puts it this way, but it was because my deeds have been better than yours that my sacrifice was accepted with favor and your sacrifice was not. So now we understand why Cain's anger was turned against Abel. Uh, he was a little too candid in explaining what had just happened. So of course Cain is mad at him, but now you might say, well, that's all well and good, but there is no argument mentioned in the biblical story. So, you know, this is an interpretation, this is creative writing. Um, but um, if you were to say that to the author of this Targum, he would answer what all ancient biblical interpreters answer under such circumstances. You're not reading the Bible carefully enough. <laughs> Well, what would he mean by that? If you go back to the biblical passage, number three on the handout, you might notice that there's something missing in the second to last line. It says, then Cain said to his brother Abel, but it doesn't say what he says. It just says, then Cain said to Abel, and when they were in the field. So from the ancient interpreter's standpoint, there's a hole in the text, and this is actually an, inv an invitation uh, at least that's how uh, the interpreters saw it, for them to fill the void. So he does. In the Targum it says, Cain said to his brother Abel, come let us both go out into the field. But that's only the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. Then they get into this theological discussion that we saw 
And that discussion is part of what's missing in the text. It's what would have fit in that hall, this argument. Uh, I should stress that however doubtful the methodology may strike readers today, such interpretations were not the musings of one or two oddballs. Biblical interpreters in those days were not hapless academics. Uh, they were respected members of the community, uh, sometimes even community leaders, and they were the experts. They were the ones who knew. So what they said the Bible meant is what it meant. Their interpretations are echoed here and there in other writings from the same period. In number five on the handout, for example, is a passage from the New Testament first letter of John. And this is what he says. And we say, well, what has he been reading? By this it may be seen who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not do right is not of God, nor he who does not love his, his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that is from the book of Genesis, that we should love one another and not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. So Cain here is one of the children of the devil, that's the expression uh, one Peter uses, and he was of the evil one. Both phrases reflect the Targum tradition of Rosemary's baby. Uh, but also, one John says, whoever does not do right is not of God. And this seems to echo what Abel said to Cain in the Targum. You didn't have any good deeds. You did not do right. Another reflection of his devilish origins. The continuation of the biblical story presents another problem, and this is in number six. The Lord said to Cain, uh, where is your brother Abel? Uh, he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. It would seem from this passage that God at first had no idea what had happened to Abel. Uh, Abel. After all, he has to ask Cain, and Cain gives him an evasive answer. Am I my brother's keeper? It's apparently only when God gets closer that he can hear Abel's brother's blood, uh, uh, Abel's blood crying out from the ground, uh, and so he discovers the terrible truth that Abel has been murdered. But of course, this doesn't sit well with the whole idea of divine omniscience. And here, it should be said, frankly, that in the vast majority of biblical texts, divine omniscience is not something that is simply assumed or even stated uh, outright. Uh, in fact. Uh, the opposite seems to be the case with a great many texts, including this one. But by the time of the ancient biblical interpreters, it was simply assumed, so they had to modify the apparent sense of this incident. So here's how this story was retold by another ancient interpreter, the first century Jewish historian uh, Josephus Flavius. This is uh, passage number seven. And I should say, uh, Josephus had a uh, rather undistinguished career as, as a soldier before uh, he became a historian. But he wrote this uh, extraordinary uh, uh, history of the Jewish people starting in its first four books uh, with a retelling of um, biblical history. And of course, uh, he actually, he said, this isn't of course, he says at the beginning that he's just going to tell you what's written in our sacred books. But at almost every turn, he adds all sorts of things that are not in the Bible. I'm not sure how conscious he was. He, he had studied uh, the Bible like most uh, well-born Jewish youths. And he um, uh, throws in these interpretations, as many people did. They really didn't know where the text began and the interpretation uh, ended. People rarely had actual copies of the books. I think Josephus did. Uh, but uh, they kind of worked from memory. So here's his retelling. Uh, Thereupon Cain, incensed at God's preference for Abel, killed his brother and hid, hid the corpse, since he thought that the matter might thus remain a secret. But God, aware of his deed, came to uh, um, Cain uh, and asked him uh, where his brother had gone since he had not seen him for many days, although previously had always seen him together with Cain. Um, Cain was thus cast uh, into uh, difficulty and finding nothing to reply to God, at first said that he was likewise surprised at not seeing his brother. <laughs> but 
but then exasperated by God's persistent, inquisitive meddling, he finally said that he was not his brother's babysitter or bodyguard responsible for whatever happened to him. At this, God accused Cain of being his brother's murderer. Well, Josephus states outright <clears throat> that God was aware of the deed. He knows the problem. It doesn't seem like God knows what happened. So he just tells you right at the beginning, God was aware of the deed. So of course he knew what happened. Uh, but then why did he ask Cain where Abel was? Apparently the purpose was to lead Cain to show his true feelings toward his brother. God gets Cain to do this through what J Josephus calls persistent, inquisitive meddling. Uh, but there is no such persistent meddling in the bibli biblical text. But once again, if you were to ask the interpreter uh, where he got this idea, he would simply say, it's obvious. Uh, you just have to read the text a little more carefully than you're doing. Uh, what would he mean by that? Well, Josephus notices that God's question, where is Abel, actually uh, causes Cain to give two different answers. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? If so, Josephus imagines that there might have been a, a gap in time between these two answers. At first, God says, where's you know, Abel? And, and, uh, and Cain says, I don't know. And then God says, you know, that's funny. I, I always used to see you two guys together, Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel. <laughs> Now, you know, Cain, <laughs> you, you must know something. And, you know, so he, <laughs> he keeps on. And then finally, after such persistent, inquisitive meddling, Cain blurts out his true feeling. Am I his babysitter? He, asks. he says in Greek, of course, it, he says, am I his keeper? But Josephus liked to, uh, you know, in this case, he, he stuck in the word, the Greek word paidagogos, which is not a pedagogue, although that's uh, what it became in English, but uh, the paedagogos was just the slave who brought the kids to, the, uh, to school and sometimes helped with their homework. But he, uh, uh, you know, it was a kind of a disparaging uh, uh, term. So Josephus has cleverly answered the problem of divine omniscience uh, that this story seemed to pose. God knew all along and was just leading Cain on to get him to inculpate himself. Well, I want to look next at the early life of Jacob, the reputed ancestor of the people of Israel. Uh, and um, the story of Jacob's birth is recounted in passage 8. When Rebekah's time came to give birth, uh, when Re Rebekah's time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a simple man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, here there wasn't any specific problem associated with the wording of the biblical text. It's just that Esau seems to come off too good and Jacob too bad. <clears throat> uh, what's wrong with that? Well, Jacob is our founder. He's the uh, you know, ancestor of the people of Israel. Um, and Esau, on the other hand, was the ancestor of the Edomites, our southern neighbor and frequent enemy. So um, uh, here Esau's out hunting food for the family and Jacob is a stay-at-home, a mama's boy, loved by his mo mother while Esau is his father's favor favorite. Um, what was Jacob doing all day? It's interesting that a number of ancient interpreters suggest that Jacob wasn't lazing around at all. He was studying. <laughs> Uh, this goes back to my favorite book, the Book of Jubilees, written around 200 or so before the Common Era. This is passage 9. Rebekah bore to Isaac two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob was a smooth and upright man, and Esau was fierce, a man of the field, and hairy. And Jacob dwelt in tents. And the youths grew, and Jacob learned to write. But Esau did not learn, for he was a man of the field and a hunter, and he learned war, and all his deeds were fierce. And Abraham loved Jacob, uh, but Isaac loved 
<coughs> excuse me, Esau. Well, here the author has done his best to improve the Bible's presentation of Jacob while at the same time uh, diminishing Esau's image. <coughs> the fact that Esau is a hunter allows Jubilees to say that he was fierce, a man of the field, and he learned war. But what about Jacob's learning to write? Where did that come from? <clears throat> Oddly enough, it comes from that particular phrase in the Bible, Jacob was a simple man living in tents. Why did the Bible say tents in the plural? How many tents does one person need? <laughs> I guess if ancient biblical interpreters were out to besmirch his reputation, they might have suggested that Jacob was something of a philanderer hopping from one tent to the other while the other men folk were out hunting. But of course, they didn't want to drag Jacob down, but rather to exalt him. So tents suggested that he had two tents. One was his own in which he lived, and the other belonged to his teacher, the one who taught him how to read and write. The same bit of ancient uh, exegesis, I'm not even sure if Jubilees originated or simply borrowed it from a still earlier source, is found in another ancient Targum, Targum Onkelos. This is passage number 10. And the two boys grew up, and Esau was a skilled hunter, a man who went out to the fields, and Jacob was a perfect man who frequented the schoolhouse. <laughs> you may have noticed that in the Jubilees passage, there's another slight change at the end. The Bible had said that Esau was his father's favorite because he liked to eat the meat of the animals Esau hunted, while Rebekah liked uh, her son Jacob best. Jubilees changes this to, uh, and Abraham loved Jacob, but Isaac loved Esau. But how dare he do this? Actually, Abraham's death had already been narrated in Genesis 25, 8, well before the story of Esau and Jacob's birth. But the author of Jubilees was a careful mathematician, and he compared Abraham's age at the time of his death, he died at the age of 175, with Isaac's age at the time of Esau's and Jacob's birth. He was 60 when they were born. Now, if Isaac had been born when Abraham was 100, that would mean he was 160 when these two boys were born. So uh, he still had plenty of time to uh, express a preference about the two boys. <laughs> and uh, of course, the Bible didn't say what Abraham's opinion of his two grandsons was. But the author of Jubilees knew that if he had been asked to express a preference, he no doubt <laughs> uh, would have said Jacob. Um, Speaking of Abraham, he was certainly considered one of the great figures of the Bible in ancient times, in part because, uh, for various reasons, ancient biblical interpreters had promoted Abraham to being the first uh, monotheist, uh, the first, in the words of Josephus, to proclaim openly that there is only one God, so that if anything is done for human benefit in the world, it is done strictly at this one God's behest. Actually, there's nothing in the book of Genesis to support this contention that he was a, the first monotheist, monotheist but uh, that is uh, nothing we can go into at this time. His monotheism apart, perhaps the best known and also the most troubling incident in Abraham's life occurs when God commands him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. The narrative begins in passage number 11. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose in the morning, early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the, di in the distance that God had shown him. Well, you probably wouldn't guess what it was in these opening verses that bothered uh, ancient interpreters. It was really none of that uh, Kierkegaard stuff, uh, you know, how could God possibly order Abraham to kill his son? Or on the other hand, how could Abraham possibly have set out to obey uh, that order? Uh, neither of these troubled ancient readers at all, apparently. The question that interpreters felt called upon to answer was, why did God need to test Abraham? After all, God certainly knew how this test would turn out. And he had, according to ancient tradition, 
already tested Abraham many times in the past, so why do it once again? You can see that this was on the mind of the author of Jubilees in his uh, retelling of the story. I should just say parenthetically and with no thought of profit or gain that uh, I recently published a uh, commentary on the book of Jubilees. As you might have heard, a walk through Jubilees. It retails on Amazon for... <laughs> I'm glad you're sitting down, $220. <laughs> uh, so I wouldn't recommend buying it. But it, uh, you, you could read the book itself. That's much cheaper. Um, it, it, this is how this story begins in Jubilee's retelling of it. In that year, there were words in heaven regarding Abraham that he was faithful in everything that he had told him, that the Lord loved him, and that in every difficulty he was faithful. Then the satanic angel Mastema, that's kind of what the devil-like figure in this book is called. Mastema really means loathing, so he's sort of the angel of loathing. Um, and the angel Mastema came and said before uh, God, Abraham does indeed love his son Isaac and finds him more pleasing than anyone else. Tell him to offer him as a sacrifice on an altar. Then you will see whether he performs this order and will know whether he is faithful in everything through which you test him. Now, the Lord was aware that Abraham was faithful in every difficulty which he had told him. He himself did not grow impatient, nor was he slow to act, for he was faithful and one who loved God. The Lord said to him, Abraham, Abraham, he replied, yes. He said to him, take your son, your dear one whom you love, Isaac, and go to a high land, offer him on one of the mountains, which I will show you. So he got up early in the morning, loaded his donkey, and took with him two servants, as well as his son Isaac. Well, what has the author of Jubilees done to explain God's action? He created a confrontation between God and the wicked angel Mastema. It's actually uh, like something that does occur in the beginning of the biblical book of Job. There, Satan challenges God to afflict the righteous Job with all sorts of evils in order to see if he holds true to his faith. So adopting that model, the author of Jubilees has the satanic Mastema issue a similar challenge uh, with regard to Abraham. You think Abraham's so good, tell him to sacrifice his son, and then you'll see if he's really your faithful servant or not. In other words, God did not need to test Abraham. Of course, he knew how the test would turn out. He only did so in order to respond to Mastema's challenge. Well, all that is well and good, but we might ask the interpreter here the same sort of question we asked before. There is no appearance of Mastema or Satan uh, or any other wicked angel in the story, so you're just making this stuff up. Um, to which, again, the author of Jubilees would give the same answer that the other ancient interpreters gave. You're not reading the text carefully enough. Well, what, what would he mean? He would point to the opening words of this passage uh, after these things. Now, normally this phrase appears in the Bible to signify a transition from one subject to the next. Such and such an incident occurred, and after these things, the next th incident happened. But by a happy coincidence, the word things uh, in Hebrew also means words. So you could read this passage as if it began, after these words, God tested Abraham. What words the Bible doesn't say, but understanding devarim as words rather than things would lead one to conclude that the Bible was hinting, here's another little hole in the text, uh, hinting at the fact that some actual words were spoken after which God called to Abraham to sacrifice his son. What could these words have been? Perhaps some angel way up there in heaven had, something, had said something that caused God to demand uh, uh, of Abraham what he did. In Jubilee's retelling, it begins with some good angels speaking words of praise of Abraham, and that is what brings Satan to challenge God. But I suspect uh, that the original form of this motif might have been even simpler. There were words in heaven spoken by Satan, and after these words, uh, Satan challenged Abraham. One way or another, this recreation seemed to answer the basic question, why should God have ordered Abraham to perform this terrible task? And this was the answer. Or was it? The end of the story seemed to raise the same question of divine foreknowledge for a second time. 
in the story, Abraham goes ahead as ordered, but at the last minute, an angel calls out to Abraham on God's behalf. This is passage number 13. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Well, I've indicated the problem here in italics. The angel speaking on God's behalf says, now I know that you fear God since you have not, not withheld your son, your only one, from me. Now I know means I didn't know before. So we're back at the same problem as before. God apparently did not know <coughs> how the test would end until after it had taken place. But this was no problem for the author of Jubilee. So let's look finally at the last passage, number 14. <coughs> Abraham built an altar and placed the wood on the altar. Then he tied up his son Isaac, placed him on the wood which was on the altar, and reached out his hand to take the knife in order to sacrifice his son Isaac. Then I, the angelic narrator, I forgot to tell you that the book is narrated by a certain angel who occasionally inserts himself into the narrative. So he's the angel mentioned in the Bible. Then I, the angelic narrator of Jubilee, stood in front of him uh, and in front of Mastema, the devil-like figure. The Lord said, tell him not to let his hand go down on the child and do nothing to him, because I know that he is one who fears the Lord. Uh, so I called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He was startled and said, yes. I said to him, do not lay your hands on the child and do not do anything to him because I know that uh, now I know uh, that you are one who fears the Lord. You have not refused me your firstborn son. The angel Mastema was put to shame. Well, the author of Jubilees, whom I know really well after 20 years, um, the author of Jubilees liked little subtleties, and um, uh, here he adds something that's not in the original biblical text, namely God's precise instructions to his angel, the book's narrator, as to what he is to say to Abraham. God's words match those announced by the angel except for one little detail. God doesn't say, now I know. He says, I know. Uh, I know, I know because I've always known. God knows everything, uh, but angels don't. So it is the angel who adds the word now in transmitting God's message. Now I know, the angel says, what I didn't know before, that Abraham is truly one who fears God and performs all that he is told to do. So this is that apparent problem that is now um, solved. I, I hope that this brief look at ancient biblical interpretation will have convinced you of what I said at the beginning of the hour. There's nothing innocent or naive about the way these interpreters interpret the biblical text. They were indeed out to create a revolution in the way in which the Bible was read and understood, and it was a revolution that succeeded famously. Their idealistic, God-centered approach is visible in nearly everything they wrote, and they transformed nearly every text in the Bible, not just the stories in Genesis and Exodus, but the biblical laws that form the center of the Pentateuch, as well as the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and other prophets, the understanding of the Psalms, which were attributed to King David, the wise sayings attributed to Solomon, and so forth. All these and much more um, uh, were, were utterly transformed by their revolutionary way of reading, a way of reading that rested firmly on the four assumptions that I listed. In keeping with these assumptions, the story of Cain and Abel became what it never was in the Bible, the story of a satanic man and the evil that he wrought. As to Cain's motive, uh, it now appeared that he murdered his brother after a lofty theological argument about the nature of God's governance in the world. And in Josephus's rendering of the story, 
any doubt as to whether God did indeed know what Cain had done disappeared entirely. Of course he knew. He was just toying with Cain when he asked him where his brother Abel had gone. By similar maneuvers, Jacob became a scholar and Abraham the first monotheist, while God's foreknowledge of the outcome of his testing of Abraham was made secure. I want to stress that this interpretation was very much the Bible. People couldn't afford Bibles and ordinary people. They simply heard the Bible expounded and where the text, the actual written words left off and the interpretation began was, uh, was almost imperceptible. Uh, this was true as much of Christians as of Jews. I've indeed quoted from uh, New Testament epistles among other sources, but this way of reading is found throughout the uh, Christian, uh, uh, throughout Christian biblical interpreters in the Gospels and other early Christian texts and the writings of Jerome and Augustine and so forth onward into the Middle Ages and beyond. Uh, indeed, the four assumptions are very much with us today in both Judaism and Christianity. Uh, certainly the interpretations have gone. A lot of this stuff is long since forgotten, but the basic idea that it's not to be taken literally, uh, and that uh, it speaks to us today, that it's a fundamentally relevant book, that it has no contradictions within it, and that it comes from, from God, these things are still very much with us. Of course, a lot has changed as well, and this is only natural archeology, span Semitic linguistics, our knowledge of the ancient Near East and Israel's neighbors, all these have given us a different perspective on the Bible and its world. But precisely for that reason, I think that we are in a better position today to appreciate the great contribution of these ancient biblical interpretations and the revolution that they introduced. In a very real sense, they rewrote all of scripture without changing a word. In fact, the very idea of scripture owes a great deal to the work of these anonymous scholars. Thank you very much.